Do you need to pass GED math? Then you'll want to know how to succeed with algebra questions. Algebra is not the only thing you need to know to pass GED math, but it is important. And I put this guide together to teach you the key things I think you should know to get more algebra questions right so you can hopefully get a higher score. Now before we jump in, know that I'm going to make a part 2 to this algebra guide for sure. And I might do a part 3, I haven't decided on that yet, but there's at least going to be a part 2, and I'm going to put a link to part 2 down in the description of this video whenever it's done. Now if there's anything in this video that you feel you don't fully understand after watching it, I recommend making time to study those topics more closely to fill in any gaps in your knowledge. And if you feel like you need some more help with any of these topics, I'll put links down below to other videos on my channel. If you're interested, you can watch them as well. Please match the equations to the solutions. So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. And if you get stuck or don't know how to do this, don't worry because we're just going to go over it. We're about to go right back to the question, but I want to give you a few quick notes here on equations first because knowing how to solve equations is one of the most important skills for passing the GED test. Now, an equation is a statement that two mathematical expressions are equal. Equations may contain one or more variables. And in the example on screen, we see that y is the variable. So you might be wondering, what is a variable? Well, a variable is a symbol we use to represent an unknown value. x, y, it could be a, it could be b. Now, to solve an equation, you must isolate the variable on one side of the equation. So in this case right here, y plus 11 equals 22, the name of the game is to get y by itself. And the way that we do this is by recognizing that we have addition, it's y plus 11, and then doing the inverse, which is another word for the opposite operation. And the opposite of addition is subtraction. So to solve this, we would want to subtract 11 from both sides. And that's really the key here with solving equations is that whatever you do to one side of the equation, you must also do it to the other. So let's get back to the example and let's see how this works. Okay, so like I said, since we're practicing right now, absolutely no worries if you have any trouble with anything in this video, because we're just going to go over it. And it doesn't matter if you get these questions right or wrong, it's just for practice and to learn from. And I know that everyone watching this is probably going to be at a different spot in their studying, so maybe this is a review for you, and or maybe you're starting from scratch. But either way, I want to start by building a foundation from the ground up. I'm going to go through these one by one here. So we start with a minus 2 equals 10. And the name of the game here is to get the a by itself on one side of our equation. So since it's a minus 2, I want to do the opposite of minus, which is plus. And the 2s will cancel out. And whatever I do to one side, I also have to do to the other. So I also have to add 2 to the 10. And if I do that, I'll figure out that a equals 12. So now let's do 5c equals 20. So the name of the game here is to get the c by itself. So 5c is the same as 5 times c. So what's the opposite of multiplication? Well, the opposite of multiplication is division. So if I divide by 5, the 5s are going to cancel out. And that's going to leave me with just the c on the left-hand side of the equation. But remember, whatever I do to one side, I also have to do to the other side. So I have to do 20 divided by 5. And when I rewrite this, I'll see that c equals 4. So now let me do x over 5 equals 5. So now we've got x divided by 5, and I want to get the x by itself. So I'm going to have to do the opposite of division. And the opposite of division is multiplication. So if I multiply by 5 on this side, the 5s cancel out. But remember, whatever I do to one side, I also have to do to the other side. So I have to do 5 times 5 to get the answer. So 5 times 5 is 25. So I see that x equals 25. So I'm going to put 25 here in the box. So now we have x minus 15 equals 22. And the name of the game here is to get that x by itself. So since it's x minus 15, I want to do the opposite of minus, which is plus. So I add 15 here, and I also have to add 15 to this side. So now let me rewrite this. So 22 plus 15 is 37. So x equals 37. So I'll put 37 in the box here. So here are the solutions right here. So here's another example of solving an equation. 
If 5x minus 30 equals 15, then x equals what? Is it A, B, C, or D? So now's your chance if you'd like to to pause the video, try this out, and as always, don't worry if you get it right or wrong, we're just practicing right now, so let me give you a chance to try it now. Okay, let's talk about this. And I know I already said this, but this is a really, really important skill to master for the GED test. So we've got 5x minus 30 equals 15. So what's my first step going to be here? Well, the first thing that I need to do is add 30 to both sides. So let me do that. And once I rewrite, I'll have 5x equals 45 because 15 plus 30 is 45. Now I've got 5x equals 45. And now what I need to do is divide by five on both sides. And what we can see here that the fives cancel out on the left-hand side, leaving me just with X. But whatever I do on one side, I also have to do it to the other. So when all is said and done, we see that X equals nine. A is the correct answer. Given the formula, two X squared minus three Y equals 10 Z. Find Z if X equals four and Y equals four. And we have four multiple choice answers to choose from. And this is another important type of question to know how to beat for your test. And the good news though is that this isn't the test, right? This is just practice. So whether you get this right or wrong, don't worry about it for now. And if you get stuck, don't worry. Absolutely no worries because we're just going to go over it. So let me give you a chance to pause the video and try this now. Okay, so let's go over this question here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is take this four and I'm gonna plug it in for X because we know that X equals four. And I'm gonna do the same with this four because we know that Y equals four. So I'm just gonna substitute four in for X and four in for Y. And let me rewrite it and show you what that's gonna look like. So once I rewrite it, I'm gonna have two times four squared minus three times four equals 10 Z. Now just note here that I'm writing out every step here for teaching purposes, but when you're doing your work, it's up to you to decide if you wanna show every single step like this or not. Now, if I do two times four squared in my calculator, I get 32. And we know that three times four is 12. So I have 32 minus 12 equals 10 Z. So what is 32 minus 12? 32 minus 12 is 20. So I have 20 equals 10 Z. Now, what's the name of the game here? Well, the name of the game is to get this Z by itself. So since I have 10 times Z, I'm gonna divide by 10. And whatever I do to one side, I also have to do it to the other side as well. So what is 20 divided by 10? 20 divided by 10 is two. And we see that Z equals two. So the correct answer here is A2. So now I'm gonna show you a trick that sometimes works to get these solve for X style questions right. So the example here is X squared minus 20 X equals negative 64. And I call this the plug-in trick. Some people call it back solving, but basically I'm gonna start with the nine here and I'm gonna plug nine into the equation for X and I'm gonna see what we get. And if we get negative 64, we'll know that A is the correct answer. If we don't get negative 64, we're gonna eliminate A and we're gonna try B. So what is nine squared? Nine squared is 81. What is 20 times nine? 20 times nine is 180. And I did that in my calculator uh, before I started recording. So 81 minus 180 is negative 99 according to my calculator. So since we didn't get negative 64, let's eliminate A. So now let's try B. So let me plug four in for X. So if I do that, what is four squared? Four squared is 16. And what is 20 times four? 20 times four is 80. So I'll have 16 minus 80, and that is negative 64. So we now see that B is the correct answer. So that's an example of how to use this trick. So I'm excited to announce that this video's champion shout out goes to a test taker who passed science recently and is now moving on to math. And the test taker says, wow, my goal is to get my GED before I turn 51 in November. And right now for those watching this, as I film this, it's September. And the test taker says, and this goal is nearly aced. Wish me luck with one test to go, bring on the math. You guys have no idea how I struggled with this GED giant for years. It's taking me to reach 50 years old to make it happen. I suggest don't wait another day. If you need your GED, do it now. Wherever you are in life, just do it anyway. 
So I again want to congratulate the test taker on passing science and wish her the best of luck with taking the math section. So if you want to see some more examples of solving equations, I'll put a link down below in the description to another video I have where I cover more examples of equations. And the skills that you'll need to solve equations are the same skills you'll need to solve inequalities. And the process for solving inequalities is very similar to solving equations, but there's really one key difference that I'll cover in just a moment. But the first point that I want you to understand about inequalities is that an inequality will have a range of answers. So if you're not sure what I mean by that, let me show you. So let me just pick a random example here. So let's say X is less than 99. So if I give you this, X is less than 99, we don't know exactly what X is, but we know that it has to be something less than 99. And down below are some signs that you should be aware of here. So this is a less than sign. This is a greater than sign. And this is a less than or equal to sign. It's a less than sign with a bar underneath it. And this is a greater than or equal to sign, and it's a greater than sign with a bar underneath it. And I know that my handwriting skills and my drawing skills are both really bad, so I appreciate you bearing with me here. Now, if I give Tommy a choice between having a little bit of food or having a lot of food, every single time he's going to pick having a lot of food. So let me make up a random example here to show my point here. So let's say 10 is less than 20. So if I look at this less than sign, and I kind of imagine that there are teeth here, and I imagine this is like a mouth, we would see that the mouth is always going to eat the bigger number. So the mouth is always going to point towards the bigger number. Now, another way that some people think about it is instead of thinking about this like a mouth, they'll imagine that this less than sign is like an arrow. And if you think about it that way, you'll have to remember that the point of the arrow always points towards the smaller number. So again, if you think about this like a mouth, the mouth always points towards the bigger number, like the mouth is going to eat the bigger number. And if you think about it like an arrow, remember that the arrow always points towards the smaller number. I could say 20 is greater than 10. So if I write it this way, see how the open mouth points towards the bigger number and the point of the arrow right here, if we think of this like an arrow, points towards the smaller number. So I just wanna give you two different ways to think about that here. So the biggest point to understand for inequality questions, if you wanna get more right on the test, is that you must reverse the inequality symbol whenever you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number. Again, to get more inequality questions right, remember that you must reverse the inequality symbol whenever you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number. So here's an example of an inequality question. If 10a minus 5 is less than 5, which of the following expressions gives all possible values of a? Is the answer a, b, c, or d? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the way that we want to start this question is by treating this less than sign as if it's an equal sign, right? So if the question said 10a minus 5 equals 5, how would you solve for a? Well, if that was the case, we would start by adding 5 to both sides. So the point I want to make here is that these inequality questions, you're going to use the same skill set that you would use if instead of having this less than sign, we'd have an equal sign. So we're going to add 5 to both sides here. So let me rewrite. So if I add 5 to both sides, I'm going to have 10a is less than 10. Now again, we started off with 10a minus 5 is less than 5. And the name of the game is to get the a by itself. So what I did was I added 5 to both sides. The 5s cancel out on the left-hand side. And 5 plus 5 on the right-hand side gives us 10. So we have 10a is less than 10. So to get the a by itself, the next step is to divide by 10 on both sides. Now, if I divide by 10 on the left, the 10s cancel out. If I divide by 10 on the right, I get 1, because 10 divided by 10 is 1. So I will now have a is less than 1. And remember, whenever you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number, then you have to reverse the inequality symbol. But in this case, we did not divide or multiply both sides by a negative number. So we just leave it as it is. So A is the correct answer here. So here's another example, and this time we have negative 10A. So if negative 10A minus 5 is less than 5, which of the following expressions gives all possible values of A? So now's your chance we'd like to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so I'm going to start this off the same way as we did the last question. So I'm going to add 5 to both sides. 
And when I do that, I'm going to be left with negative 10a is less than 10. Now this time to get the a, I want to divide both sides by negative 10. So the negative 10s cancel out on the left, and on the right, I'm doing 10 divided by negative 10. So when I divide by negative 10, I get negative 1. But the key here is that instead of writing a is less than negative 1, I need to reverse the sign. So I'll have a is greater than negative 1. So remember, you must reverse the inequality symbol whenever you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number. So in this case here, we divided both sides by negative 10. So that's why I had to take that less than sign and I had to reverse it and make it a greater than sign. Greater than sign, I should say. So the final answer here is a is greater than negative one. So this is just an example of putting this rule into practice. And that rule again is that you must reverse the inequality symbol whenever you multiply or divide both sides by a negative number. So the next example says, for which value of x below is the inequality 9x is less than 18 true? Is the answer A, B, C, or D? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out, take all the time you need. And then whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so there is a little bit of a twist here to this question. So we're gonna start off by just getting X by itself. So to do that, we're gonna divide by nine on both sides. So the nines cancel out on the left and on the right we get two because 18 divided by nine is two. So we'll have X is less than two. So if you got to this step, you did a good job by getting here. But if you thought that two was the correct answer, know that there is actually a twist here. So two is not the correct answer. So if you picked A, don't feel bad. Again, we only care about the learning for right now. And if you picked A, you were on the right track, but we do have to understand the twist. And this is telling us that X is less than two. So if X is something less than two, it can't be two. So that's why A is out here, all right? So C and D are also incorrect. And the reason is because we know that X has to be something less than two. Since eight and 29 are greater than two, we roll them out. And we know that one is a number less than two. So B is the correct answer here. So again, if you got this wrong, don't feel bad at all because there is a little twist here. If you got this right, great job. If you got it wrong, great job for trying anyway. Hopefully this makes sense now. So I wanna close out our segment on inequalities by touching briefly on number lines. And if you feel like you need more practice with inequalities, I'm gonna put a link down below in the description to a video I have on inequality. So feel free to watch that if you'd like to. And I don't wanna say a whole lot about number lines here, but there are two points that I think are important to touch on. And the first is that a closed circle means the number is included in the solution set. And an open circle means the number isn't included in the solution set. And if you're not sure exactly what this means, I think that hopefully this example problem will clarify it. So the example problem says, the graph below shows the solution of an inequality as all possible values of x. Which of the following is a possible value of x? And instead of saying if here, this should say of. So the question is, which of the following is a possible value of x? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try this out, take all the time you need. Don't worry about it if you get stuck because we're just gonna go over the answer. So let me give you a chance to try it now. Okay, so right off the bat here, we see that our arrow starts with an open circle here at two. Okay, so we see this open circle here at two and we see this arrow keeps going here. So we can rule out zero and negative five because the arrow starts at two and it keeps going to the right. So zero and negative five are not included here. Now, when we look at the two, we know that we have an open circle at the two. And an open circle means the number isn't included in the solution set. So we're gonna take A out because again, two has an open circle and we know that the open circle means that two isn't included in the solution set. So we're left with D, nine is the correct answer. And even though we don't see the number nine showing up here in the number line, we know that nine is included because this arrow, it's gonna go on until infinity. So it's going to include the nine. So D is the correct answer here. Tommy, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No? So now let's talk about word problems. And when I teach word problems here on my channel, I like to teach a five-step strategy, and you can use this five-step strategy to help you get more word problems right. Now, if you've seen my videos before, 
you might have heard me talk about this before. So thank you for coming back if you've watched my channel before. I really appreciate you joining me here on another video. And if you're new and this is the first video you've watched on my channel, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you giving my channel a shot. But either way, this five-step strategy you should know is not something that I came up with on my own, but it is one that I teach on my channel. And if you're wondering how you're going to remember five steps, well, you really only have to remember one word, and that word is Fios. The F in Fios stands for find. What do you need to find? The I stands for info. What information do you need to solve the question? And what information did they give me already? And the O stands for operation or operations if you need to do more than one. And the S does two things. So the S stands for solve. So you solve the question and then ask, does the answer I got make sense? So the S stands for solve and sense. So when it comes to operations, what I mean are things like addition and subtraction. So addition means to combine, subtraction means to find the difference, and multiplication means to combine more than once. Now multiplication is really repeated addition, and a clue in word problems that you might have to multiply is when they give you one of something and then ask you to find more. Whenever you see that in a word problem, that could be a clue that you have to multiply. And division means to break a number into equal sized groups. So when it comes to picking which operation you have to use, you can sometimes find keywords within the word problems that will clue you into which operation you have to do. So I'm going to give you a list of these keywords next, but just keep in mind here that you still have to use your critical thinking skills and you still have to use your problem solving skills. It's not always going to be as simple as just finding a keyword in a word problem and then that's automatically going to tell you what to do. So it's not always going to be that simple. And again, you still have to think critically, but I'm just going to give you a list of keywords for each operation just to help you out. So for addition, some keywords would be add, more than, some, all together, total, increase, and in all, and also plus. Now for subtraction, keywords would be less than, decrease, difference, left, and lost. For multiplication, there would be product, times, multiplied by, double, triple, etc., and of. Now division would be per, quotient, each. So here's a basic word problem example. Tasha has 35 pages to read for homework. If she finished 12 at school and 9 on the bus, how many pages does she have left to read? So let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, just unpause the video, and whether you get it right or wrong, we'll talk about it. So the last sentence here tells us what we need to find. So we need to find how many pages she has left to read. And the information that we're given here is, first of all, that she has 35 pages total to read for homework. And we're also told that she's finished 12 at school and nine on the bus. So what is 12 plus nine? 12 plus nine is 21. So we know that she's already read 21 pages. Now, what operation do we have to use? Well, we see the word left here and left is a key word for subtraction. So in this case, the way we get that we get the right answer is we do 35 minus 21. And 35 minus 21 is 14. So the correct answer here is C14. To cover one couch, Rick needs 48 feet of fabric at a price of $12 per foot. How many feet does he need for six couches? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, let's talk about this question here. So let's start by clarifying what we're actually asked to find. So we need to find how many feet he needs for six couches. Now, what information do we have here? Well, we know that to cover one couch, Rick needs 48 feet of fabric. So that's going to be important to getting the question right. And it says at a price of $12 per foot. Now, this $12 per foot, this is actually extra information that they've given us that we won't need to solve the question. So just a quick tip here, you know, sometimes in word problems, they'll give you extra information that you don't need to solve the question. So just watch out for that. And so what operation do we need to use here? Well, we don't just see one clear keyword that jumps out at us here, but sometimes a clue for multiplication is that you'll be given one of something and asked to find more. And in this case here, we are told the number of feet he needs to cover one couch and asked to find how many feet he needs to cover six couches. 
So in this case, we're going to multiply. So we want to do 48 times 6. And if we do that, we will get the correct answer here. 48 times 6 equals 288. Now on the test, I would expect to get harder word problem examples than this one in the previous one, but I just wanted to kind of lay a foundation here just to cover our bases. And we're going to move forward now and talk about translations and other important algebra skills, but just know that I do have other videos on word problems. And I'll put a link to some of those down below. So here's a different example. And in this case, we don't have to actually do the math. We just have to set the problem up. And it says here, choose the correct translation for the following. 12 more than a number is 30. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, let's talk about this one. So on our keyword list, we know that the word more is often going to translate to addition, and we also know that is can translate to equals. 12 more than a number is 30. So the best fit here is B. 12 plus B equals 30. And this is a skill here, this translating these statements into equations. This is a skill here that's really important. And often you'll have to do this skill when you're given a word problem on your test. And you might have to write out equations like this to get the word problem correct. And it's an just an important skill to practice overall. So let's look at another example here. So it says Erica and Kenny have a total of 12 pairs of sneakers. So choose the correct translation for the following. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video and whenever you're ready, we'll go over this. So the word total here is our clue, hopefully, that we need to add. So E plus K equals 12 is the correct answer here. So the next example says, Tim has 14 more games than David. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So what's the correct answer here? The correct answer here is D, and there are two different ways to translate this. Okay, so Tim has 14 more games than David. So we can think of it as T equals D plus 14, because the number of games that Tim has is the number that David has plus 14. But we could also do T minus D equals 14, right? The number of games that Tim has minus the number that David has equals 14 because Tim has 14 more than David. So A and B are both valid ways to translate this statement. Jim has made an investment and tripled his money. If he ended up with $75, which equation below could be used to determine the amount of his original investment? Is the answer A, B, C, or D? Let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. So the correct answer here is C, right? So 3A equals 75. So if the amount of his original investment is A, and we know that he made an investment that tripled his money, and he ended up with $75, we would say that 3A equals 75 is the equation that you could use to figure out the original investment of A dollars. Tommy, I was gonna have you teach the next one, but it looks like you're too busy playing games. So now let's talk about how to find the coordinates of a point. So we have an x-axis here and we have our y-axis here, and this is our point. So the first question is, what are the coordinates of this point? So let me give you a chance now to pause the video. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry about it. I just want to give you a chance now to try this out. So let me give you a chance to do that now. Okay, so what are the coordinates of this point? Well, whenever we write an ordered pair, we always want to write the x coordinate first. So for this dot right here, how do we figure out what the x coordinate is? Well, one way to do it is to start with the dot and make a straight line from the dot going all the way down to the x axis. So if we do that, we see that we hit the x axis at one. So I'm gonna put a one here in my ordered pair. And again, we always wanna put the x coordinate first when we write our pair. So now let's do the y here. So what is the y coordinate? So if I start at this dot and I just come over here and make a straight line from the dot to the y axis, we see that the y coordinate is six. So the coordinates of this point are one and six. So here's another point here on the line. And this time I'd like you to tell me what are the coordinates of this point right here? So this point right here, what are the coordinates? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out. And whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. 
Okay, so let's write out our ordered pair here. And we always want to put the x coordinate first. So how do I find the x coordinate? Well, I want to start at the dot and I want to look towards the x axis. And we see here that the x coordinate is negative three. Okay, and so now let's find the y coordinate. So to find the y coordinate, I want to start at my dot and I want to look towards the y axis. And we see here that the y coordinate is negative two. So the answer here is negative three, negative two. So the next example that I wanna cover is on the screen now. It says fill in the y column for the table below. And we have an equation, y equals one over three x minus 10, and we have our table right here. So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the key here is that we want to take each value for x and we wanna plug each one into the equation for x and we're gonna see what y equals. And if you're not sure what I mean, if that sounded really confusing, then don't worry because I'm just gonna explain it right now and hopefully it'll make more sense when we go over it. So I'm gonna start with negative three and what I'm gonna do is take this negative three and I'm gonna substitute it into the equation in place of x. So let me show you what that's gonna look like. So when I rewrite it, I'll have y equals one over three times negative three minus 10. And again, this negative three is just because I took the negative three here and I plugged it in in place of x. So when I do this here, I'll have y equals negative one minus 10 because one third times negative three gives us negative one. So I have negative one minus 10 and negative one minus 10 is negative 11. So the first answer that I'm gonna put in the box here is negative 11. So now let's do the same thing if x equals zero. So if x equals zero, I'm gonna take this zero and I'm gonna substitute it in here in place of the x. y equals one over three times zero minus 10, and one over three times zero is just zero. So I'll have y equals negative 10. So the next answer that I'm gonna put in the box is negative 10. So now let's see what y equals if x equals three. So I'm gonna take this three and I'm gonna plug it into the equation in place of x. So let me rewrite this. So one over three times three is just one. So I'll have y equals one minus 10. And what is one minus 10? One minus 10 is negative nine. So the last answer here that should go in the box is negative nine. So the next example says point C lies at negative seven, five on a coordinate grid. The graph of which of the following equations passes through point C is the answer A, B, C, or D. So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to, to pause the video, try to figure this out. And if you get stuck, don't worry about it because we're just gonna go over the answer. Okay, so if you had no idea how to do this question, absolutely no worries because we're just gonna talk about it. So when we look at our pair here, we have to remember that the first number is an x coordinate and the second number is a y coordinate. So the idea here is that we want to take each equation and we want to plug x in until we get five as our answer. Okay, and if you're not sure what I mean by that, don't worry, let me go over it now. So let's start with this equation here, this y equals 12 x plus three. So let me take negative seven and let me plug that in for x. So when I rewrite this, I'll have y equals 12 times negative seven plus three. Now, if we do this math in our calculator or however you wanna do it, we get negative 81. So we know that A is the wrong answer here because we know that we have to get five as our answer. So in other words, y has to equal five for the answer to be correct. So now let's try B here. So B, we have y equals five x minus two. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take this negative seven and we're gonna plug it in here for x, and we're gonna do the math, and we're gonna see if we get five. So if we do the calculation and we get five, that means that we have the right answer, and if not, then we don't have the right answer. So let me rewrite this, so I'll have five times negative seven minus two. So I do the math, and I see that this equals negative 37. So this is also, b is also gonna be the incorrect answer. So now what I wanna do is I want to take this negative seven, and I wanna plug it in here for the x in answer choice C, and let's see what we get. So when I plug in negative seven, this is what it would look like, negative two times negative seven minus nine. And when I do the calculation, I see that we get five. So C is the correct answer here. So now let's talk about slope. And slope is an important topic to understand for the GED test. 
Now, there are different versions of the test and there's no guarantee exactly which types of questions you're gonna get on the version of the test that you get when you get in there, but slope is still an important topic and I'm about to show you the basic things that you should know about slope. But first, I wanted to show you some of the things that test takers have said about slope in the past. And these comments are from several years ago now, but the GED testing service has not made any major changes to the math section in many years now. So even though these comments are old, they're still just as relevant today as they were a couple years ago. So hopefully these test takers have passed the test by now, but if not, I wish them the best of luck with everything if they're still studying. Slope is a number that describes the steepness of a line. So let me show you what I mean by that. So imagine that we have two lines. So let's call this line one and let's call this line two. Now imagine that both lines are hills and imagine now that someone goes to the top of line one and drops a ball and lets the ball roll down hill one. And also imagine that someone goes to the top of hill two and also drops a ball on top of hill two and lets the ball roll down the hill. Which hill do you think the ball is gonna roll down faster? Hill one or hill two? Well, hill one looks steeper than hill two. So the ball's gonna roll faster down hill one compared to hill two. And both of these lines have a different slope. And again, slope is a number that describes the steepness of a line. And when I taught this in a previous video, instead of using rolling the ball down the hill as an example, I used running down the hill. And I had a test taker comment, and I can't remember offhand exactly what the test taker said, but the test taker basically said that it might be better to use rolling the ball down the hill. And I actually like that idea, so that's why I put that in this video. So I did go and find that comment from the previous video I made on slope, and I'll put a link to that video down below. And I just want to give this test taker credit because I think it's a good idea. So champion shout out to the person who recommended the idea. So on screen, we have a standard example of a slope question. And the question says, a line passes through the points at coordinates 2, negative 8, and 14, 4. What is the slope of the line? And so to save you time since we're just practicing, I put the formula that you need to use to get this question right, right here. And just know that on the test, you're going to have to go to the formula sheet that they'll give you on the test and pick out the formula to use it. But just for the sake of time since we're practicing, I just gave you the formula to use. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video and try this out. And if you get stuck, don't worry, because we're just gonna go over the answer. So I recommend when you're doing a question like this to start with the first pair of numbers that we get. And I recommend just making the first number x1 and the second number y1. So that's how I recommend you start. And then when you come to the second pair, just make the first number x2 and make the second number y2. Okay, so that's how I recommend doing this. But basically, if you set it up this way, all you have to do then is take your y2, which is 4, plug it into the equation for y2. Okay, and then we're going to do the same thing with y1. So our y1 is negative 8. So I'm going to plug negative 8 into the equation for y1. So when I write this down, I'll write 4. I can write 4 plus 8 because 4 minus negative 8 is the same as 4 plus 8. So when I come down here, what is my x2? Well, my x2, it's hard to see, but I labeled 14 as x2. So I'm going to put 14 in here for x2. And I know that my x1 is 2, so I'm going to put 2 in here for x1. So down here, I would have 2. So I have 4 plus 8 over 14 minus 2. And 4 plus 8 is 12. And 14 minus 2 is 12. And 12 divided by 12 just equals 1. So the correct answer here is C1. So the next example I want to cover says, what is the slope of the line shown in the graph below? So this time we need to figure out the slope using this graph. And I have provided the formula again for slope just to save you some time. But again, you'll want to look this up on the formula sheet on the test. And so let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out. And whenever you're ready, we'll go over it. Okay, so one thing I probably should have said this earlier, but just ignore that this says 34 here. I took this question out of a collection of problems I wrote many years ago now, and I probably have covered this example before somewhere else on my channel, but I think it's relevant here. And so let's go over this example now. So the first step here is to pick out two points on the line. Now you say, how do I know which points to pick out? It doesn't matter. Just make sure there are two points on the line. So I'm going to pick this point right here. And let me label this. So the x here is 0, and the y coordinate is 4. 
So the first point I'm, I picked out here is 0 and 4. So let me call this x1 and let me call this y1. So now I'm going to pick another point on the graph and I could go with anything here. Uh, I'm going to go with this point right here though. Okay, so I'll pick this point right here. So my x coordinate for this point is negative 2 and my y coordinate here is 0. So let me call this negative 2 x2 and let me call this 0 y2. Two. So now I want to use this formula here. So the formula, it says slope equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And this m here just represents the slope. So I need to do y2 minus y1. So what's my y2? Well, I picked 0 as my y2. So I want to do y2 minus y1. So I'm going to do 0 minus 4. And now I want to do x2 minus x1. So my x2 is negative 2, so I have negative 2 minus x1, which is 0. So 0 minus 4 is just simply negative 4. Now I have negative 2 minus 0, which is negative 2. So I have negative 4 divided by negative 2, and the answer is positive 2. So if you're still confused about what I did with the first step here where I picked two points, let me show you why it doesn't matter which two points you pick as long as they're on the line. So let's say this time, let me pick this point right here. So what are the coordinates of this point right here? Well, the x coordinate, which I always write first, is 1, and the y coordinate of this point right here is 6. So again, I just picked this point at random. So now the first number here, I make, my, I make that x1, and the second number, I make y1. So now let me just pick another point here at random. So let's just say, I don't know, let's pick this point right here. So this point right here, the x coordinate is 2. And this point right here, the y coordinate is 8. So I've got 2 and 8. And the 2 here, this is my x2. And the 8 here, let me make this y2. So now let's do the same thing, y2 minus y1. So what is y2 minus y1? Well, in this case, I made 8y2, and I made 6y1, so my y2 minus y1 is 8 minus 6, and my x2 minus x1, I would be doing 2 minus 1, right? So 2 minus 1. So what is 8 minus 6? 8 minus 6 is 2. What is 2 minus 1? 2 minus 1 is just 1, and 2 divided by 1 is just 2. So see how I get the same answer? For certain questions, for the next couple questions, I am going to show written solutions, and I typed these out several years ago. Uh, but you can pause the video if you want and study this written solution. If not, that's fine too. We'll keep moving. So the next example here says, which is true about the graph below? And let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the concepts we need to talk about here are positive and negative slopes and also the y-intercept. So First and foremost, what is the y-intercept? Well, the y-intercept is simply where the line crosses the y-axis. So right here we see that the line crosses the y-axis at 6. So we know that 6 is the y-intercept. So C is a true statement here. So when I look at this line right here, what I see is that the line starts up here in the upper left quadrant and goes all the way down here to the lower right. So we note that this line has a negative slope. Now, if the line looked like this, if it started down here in the bottom left quadrant and went up here to the upper right quadrant, we would say that this line has a positive slope. So you can tell if it's a positive or negative slope just by looking at the line. The other way to tell would be to actually pick two points on this line and use the slope formula and calculate the slope. And if the slope is negative, then you would know that obviously it has a negative slope. So you could calculate the slope and see if it's positive or negative, or you could just look at the line and tell if it's negative or positive. So the answer here is E, B, and C are correct. And let me show you the written solution that I typed out for this several years ago. And you could take all the time you need, maybe pause the video, add anything to your notes if you want to. And whenever you're ready, we'll go on to the next question. What is the x-intercept of the line y equals negative 1x plus 2? So let me give you a chance now if you'd like to to pause the video, try to figure this out, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, let's talk about this question here. So what is the x-intercept? Well, simply put, the x-intercept is where the line crosses the x-axis. So remember, the axis that goes left and right is the x-axis, and we see that the line crosses right here at 2. So just by looking, we can already tell that it's 2. 
But what if we didn't have this graph? What if we were just given y equals negative 1x plus 2? Well, we could still figure out the x-intercept. And the way we would do that is by putting a 0 in for y. So to find the x-intercept here, we could put 0 in for y. So if we did that, we would have 0 equals negative x plus 2. You really don't need to write this negative 1 here. You can just write negative x. And so now let's solve for x. So what we would do here is we could just simply, well, you could do two things. You could subtract 2 from both sides, or you could also add x to both sides. So let me just do that. And if I add x to both sides, I'll see that I get x equals positive 2. Okay, so two ways to look at this question here. You're given a line like this, and you can just look and see where it crosses the x-axis. That's probably easier, the easier way to do it. But if you weren't given a line like this, you could do it with the equation. You would just have to make y zero and solve the equation for x. And so one other thing I want to note here. So I said that you could solve for x in this scenario by adding x to both sides. But I said you could also do it by subtracting 2. So if you subtracted 2, let me show you how you would get x. So if we subtract 2 on the right, the 2s cancel out. And on the left, we would have negative 2 equals negative x. So from this point, all we would do is just change both of these signs to positive, right? So we would end up with 2 equals x. So that's how you would do it if you took that different step earlier on in the process. But either way, you would still get 2. So let me give you the written solution now. You can take all the time you need and pause the video and study it if you want to. And if not, that's fine too. And whenever you're ready, we'll go on to the next example. Okay, so here's your next example on the screen. What is the y-intercept of the line y equals negative 3x plus 8? Now, if you can do this question by just looking at the line here, that's great. But I'd also like you to think about how would you do it if you didn't have this picture here and you just had y equals negative 3x plus 8. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video, try to figure this out, take all the time you need. And whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so the y-intercept is where the line crosses the y-axis. So right here we see this is our y-axis and we see that the line crosses the y-axis at 8. So right away we know that the answer is 8, but I also just want to make sure that we review how to do this if we weren't given this picture here. So if all we had was y equals negative 3x plus 8 and we had to find the y-intercept, how would we do that? Well, we would put a 0 into this equation for x. So let's say that we made x 0. If we made x 0, negative 3 times 0 is just 0. So we'd be left with y equals 8. Okay, so again, you can just look at the graph here in this case and see that the line crosses at 8. But we could also look at our y equals negative 3x plus 8 and plug 0 in for x. And that's another way that we could see that the answer here is 8. So let me show you the written solution for this question. You can pause the video, take all the time you need to study it. And if you don't want to, that's totally fine too. We'll move right along whenever you're ready. The gold and blue lines on the graph are parallel. If the equation of the gold line is y equals 3 over 4x plus 6, which the following is false. And I just wrote a g here on the top line just to note that this is the gold line. And I put a b here on the lower line just to note that this is the blue line. And so we have answer choices a, b, c, D and E. And this is a hard question here. This is a tricky question. And some of these concepts that you have to know to get this right, I haven't covered yet in this video. So if you have any trouble with this, please don't worry about it at all, because we're just going to go over it. And, you know, this question here is covering several different skills in, in this one question here. And so I just want to point out here that this is a harder question. So don't worry if you have trouble with this at all. So let me give you a chance now to pause the video and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so to get this question right, the first thing that I want you to understand is the standard form of a linear equation. So the standard form of a linear equation looks like this. It's y equals mx plus b. And the m stands for slope, and the b is the y-intercept. Okay, so if I look at the equation of the gold line, y equals 3 over 4x plus 6, just by looking at this, I can tell that 3 over 4 is the slope. And I can also tell that the y-intercept is 6. Another way to tell that the y-intercept is 6 is by looking at the gold line here, I can see that it crosses the y-axis at 6. Okay, so these two lines are parallel. 
So parallel lines have the same slope. So that's the first thing that I want you to know about parallel lines. And, and I'll, there'll be a written solution at the end of the video for you to take notes to, because I know I'm throwing a lot at you here. But anyway, both of these lines are going to have the same slope because they're parallel lines. So if the slope of the gold line is 3 over 4, the slope for the blue line is also 3 over 4. So we know that A is correct and we know that C is correct. So what about B? The equation of the blue line is y equals 3 over 4x plus 3. How can we tell if that's true or false? Well, first of all, we know that both lines are going to have the same slope. So the first part of this looks pretty good because we know that the blue line, the equation is going to have y equals 3 over 4x because it has the same slope as the gold line. So this 3 right here, that's the y-intercept. So we have to confirm, does the blue line have 3 as the y-intercept? Well, we can just look at the blue line and see that it crosses the y-axis at 3. So B looks correct. The equation of the blue line is y equals 3 over 4x plus 3. Now, the alternative way to figure that out would be to use the point-slope formula. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, I'm going to show you how to use the point-slope formula shortly here in the video. But just know that there are different ways to figure out B. But I think the faster way to do it is to recognize that the slope is going to be identical to the gold line and to look here and see that the y-intercept is 3. So that's hopefully how you would recognize that B is correct here. So A, B, and C are correct. And what about D? Is D true or false? The blue and gold lines will eventually intersect. Well, that's a key point to note about parallel lines. For parallel lines, we know that they will never intersect. So D is incorrect. And since D is a false statement, we know that that's the correct answer here because we're looking for which of the following is false. So I have a written solution here. I typed this out a while ago. The last few questions, I think I've covered these before on this channel in different places, but I want to put them all in this one video because it's all relevant here to our discussion. But I have the solution here. I know I threw a lot at you. So if you want to, please take your time and pause and uh, study this as long as you need to. And whenever you're ready, we'll move on to the next question. So I'm about to reveal this video's Champions Challenge question. And if you disagree with me on this and you think that one of the other questions in the video was harder than the one I'm about to show you, please let me know down below in the comments if you'd like to. And actually the last question that I covered, that could have been the Champions Challenge, but I did go with this one. And here is this question. It's which the following is an equation for the line that passes through negative 5, 16, and 0, negative 4. And I've given you the two formulas you'll need to get this question right, uh, just to save you some time. But as always, you'll want to get these formulas on the formula sheet that they'll give you when you go to take the test. And this is the formula for slope. And this is the point slope form of the equation of a line. So let me give you a chance to pause the video and try this out. And as always, don't worry if you get stuck because we're just going to go over it. So the first step here is to find the slope. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this pair here, this negative 5 and 16. And this negative 5, I'm going to make it x1. And this 16, I'm going to make y1. Now remember, the first number in a coordinate pair is always an x. And the second number in the coordinate pair is always a y. So I just picked this negative 5 and made it x1, and I picked this 16 as y1. So now I'm going to come over to my second pair, and I have 0 and negative 4. And the first number in the pair always has to be an x. And since I've already made negative 5 x1, I want to make this 0 x2. So now I come to my second number in the pair, which is negative 4. Now remember, the second number in the pair always has to be a y. So I'm going to make this y2. And I made it y2 because I already made 16 y1. So now what I do is I use the slope formula and I'm going to plug the numbers into the formula for slope. So my y2 is negative 4 and my y1 is 16. And I made my x2 0 and I made my x1 negative 5. Okay, so let me plug these numbers into the formula. So y2 is negative 4, so I have negative 4 minus 16 because 16 is my y1. So for x2 minus x1, x2 is 0 and I want to subtract negative 5. So if I do minus negative 5, that's the same as plus. So I can make this 0 plus 5. So negative 4 minus negative 16 is negative 20. 0 plus 5 is just 5. So negative 20 divided by 5 equals negative 4. Okay, so negative 4. And we're not done yet, but we've just figured out that the slope equals negative 4. So let me just put this up here so we don't forget. The slope equals negative 4. 
So now how do I use this formula? Y minus Y1 equals slope times X minus X1. Well, let me show you how to set it up here. So I put Y minus Y1, and what is my Y1? Well, remember, Y1 is 16. So I do Y minus 16 equals slope, and I calculated that negative four is the slope, so I put negative four here, all right, times x minus x1. Now we know that x1 is negative five, so x minus negative five is the same as x plus five. Okay, so now there are two things I could do first. So there are two different ways I should say to approach the question here. So I could add 16 to both sides first, or I could distribute the negative four first. It's up to you how you wanted to do this. What I like to do is I like to do the multiplication here first. So I'm gonna do negative four times X, then I'm gonna do negative four times five. Then after I do that, I'm gonna add the 16 over. All right, but like I said, you could start by adding 16 to both sides and that's a perfectly valid way to do the question. So negative four times X is negative four X. Negative four times positive five is negative 20. So I now have y minus 16 equals negative 4x minus 20. So now what I want to do is add 16 to both sides. So if I add 16 on the left side, 16s cancel out. And whatever I do to one side, I also have to do it to the other. So I have to add 16 over here as well. So when I do the math here, I'll figure out that y equals negative 4x minus 4. Because negative 20 plus 16 is negative 4. So when all is said and done, the correct answer here is y equals negative four x minus four. Now, if you got the slope calculation right, if you did this step here and you got slope equals negative four, you might've been able to just look at the answer choices. And you might've even been able to see that the only one that has negative four as the slope was b. And so without even actually using this formula, you might've been able to identify that b was the correct answer. So if you did that really good job in seeing that, but it's important to still know how to use this formula. So that's why I just took the time to break down how you would use this formula as well.